This is it, guys. One last session. And um, this one is a little bit unusual. Uh, it's, I'm going to share with you um, the beginning of what I hope to be a great story. Um, it's a demonstration project the Coffin Foundation is working on. Uh, so it's not, there's no success stories yet. Um, but I do, I do want to share with you because it really exemplifies, I feel, the magic of collaboration, what you can achieve, the impact you can have uh, with patients if you actually work together. So uh, partnerships, collaborations are very obvious for when you think about, okay, I'm going to work with a hospital, I'm going to work with a doctor, I'm going to work with a payer. But sometimes you miss or don't think about potentially working with or collaborating with fellow entrepreneurs that have technologies that are complementary, sometimes competitive, but that if you work together, you could potentially have a higher impact in the communities in which they are being used. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of context of how we came to this demonstration project, why we care, why we're trying to do this. So I'll roll with the first slide. So last year, we set up a task force. So my colleague, I have a very diverse set of, of colleagues, um, brilliant colleagues. One of them is Bob Lighton. He's a world-class economist, legal scholar. Um, and he assembled a task force last year to try to tackle the question of how do we fix our U.S. healthcare system? How do we improve, how do we improve productivity? How do we improve outcomes? So the big, hairy problem that we face today. And this is a very important question for us because you know, healthcare will be 20% of GDP. It's a big threat to our economy in terms of capital available for investment, innovation, and potentially jobs. So as a foundation, it's something that's very, very important to us. And out of that task force came out a key set of recommendations that we think could help steer us back in the right direction. This white paper, Valuing Healthcare, Improving Productivity and Quality, came out a couple months ago. Um, as a next step, we really wanted to try and actually implement one of the recommendations in the real world setting to sort of show the proof. Does it really work? Does you really, really see improvements in outcome? Do you really see costs going down? So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, mental gymnastics to give you a little background of how I think about the problem and how we came to what is now this demonstration project. And uh, hopefully, you'll be able to follow along. It will be a test. We'll see, we'll see that. So um, I, I think visually, and when I think about especially of, of complex problems, I, I think visuals are helpful. That said, I'm not a very good drawer. So I, um, I reached out to a friend entrepreneur, uh, Jason Brown from Pendulum Swing Media. And he was very generous with his time and very quickly sketched up a couple of things for me to help, help me tell the story. So when I think about the, the I call the healthcare continuum, going from research to development, clinical research to delivery. So this is a lot about what we talked about over the last few days. Payment of care and long-time healthcare, not in terms of the patient itself, but also in the communities in which we live. As you can see, we typically think about it in a longitudinal fashion. But as we know, these things happen today in parallel. And usually, there's not a lot of greater connectivity among those different worlds in terms of data flow and information. They're pretty segregated. Uh, and even within each of those circles, even within research or development, there's not always the best flow of data uh, around what people are learning uh, and, or where, where how people are failing. So what about, this is a visionary, what, is, what if the world looked like this? What if all these different sets of people and stakeholders were interconnected? and have the ability to share information and learn from each other and more quickly iterate and advance innovation. Wouldn't that be great? Um, connectivity in itself is not, is, is great, but it really doesn't really do much it's, at some level. You go from a no data, which is a bad situation, to too much data, it's like what, what do I do with this? To, potentially being able to select the right data sets in the right context and have those aha moments that we hope to have more of. If you think about also, think about the patient in the context of care, there's an additional layer that you need to think about in terms of what are the different data sets and how you visualize that information for each per different patient persona or even physician persona. So it's sort of adapting design thinking into this overall uh, concept here. All right, so how do, we, how do we do that, and how do, we, how do we think about it? So if we actually have able to achieve this, have select the right data at the right time, in the right context, we suddenly have 
transparency. You start understanding what's happening in our system. What are the pain points? What, why are we seeing these things happen? And what could, potentially could we fix? So and for the specifics of this demonstration project, we wanted to do, create this connectivity, have this connectivity be patient-centered, so the patient has full access to their own information and can provide that information to whomever they please in, within the, the context of this healthcare continuum, whether it's physicians, delivery of care, payment of care, so that we can really start tracking very quickly, you know, thinking about, again, outcomes and costs of care. So, Here's, imagine, imagine this to be a, a salad bowl. I'm not the best drawer or PowerPoint person, but imagine this is a salad bowl and you want, you want to create this experiment to see that if you create a patient-centered approach to care, you have create and that transparency, then now you have the ability to actually create and intervene in the right appropriate way, you'll see improved outcomes for patients and lower costs of care. So a little audience participation question here. What, what are the ingredients you need to have in order to test that hypothesis? What's the first thing you really need? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so Improved Care Now is a partnership between over 30 children's hospitals across our country, pediatric GI docs, that um, you know, share best practices, learn from each other, their, their models. So one of their fearless leaders out of Cincinnati Children's, Peter Margolis, has this great model, I, I, which has become mine, is steal shamelessly, share seamlessly. So by, by sharing best practices, they've been in, in, not introducing new therapeutics, just sharing best practices among institutions, they've been able to improve remission rates from the 50s near to 80%, just by using what they already have available to them. That's pretty, very, very impressive. And as part of that, they've set up a sort of a toolkit for those institutions that are collaborating to actually make those interventions called the C3N, the Collaborative Chronic Care Network. So what is the other piece of the ingredient that you need to do, to test such an hypothesis? Any guesses in the audience? Network, thank you. So here comes um, PKB, Patients Know Best, the personal health record system that's fully integrated across all sites of care. The uh, entrepreneur in, in, who's a founder is Mohammed al Ubaidli, who's actually with us today, virtually, he's dialing in. And his, actually, his is the first one to get fully integrated in the NHS in the UK, he's out of Cambridge in, in the UK. Um, and enabling that full visibility. Imagine a patient have access to all their medical records, lab values, notes, and can in turn make that available to whomever they want, whether it's caregivers, family members, or other physicians at different facilities. What's the other thing that you need to actually make this? Now you have the, you have the people, the patients, you have the connectivity. What else do you need on top of that? The doctors? Well, I guess the doctors are part of the network and they are indirectly. That's a good one, of course. What else do you need? So one of the things we think about is sort of um, patient activation or really uh, enabling patients to um, relate and learn from each other and become uh, less um, uh, isolated and engaged with their care. So uh, one of our, our entrepreneurs with us today is Sean Ahrens, the founder of Chronology. Um, and he's created an amazing platform where a lot of patient, cr patients suffering from Crohn's are able to share whether it's how they're feeling, um, nutrition, meds, et cetera, and help them be more engaged and feel less isolated uh, in their daily experience. The other things that are really important to all these technologies, so Ginger.io, so uh, Anmol is with us today. Um, so passive monitoring, seeing what is happening with a patient before they know something's happening. So being able to be preemptive in the care and intervening before problems that occur. Um, the big thing that I mentioned earlier is uh, understanding what, who are the patients and how they behave differently. What are the different personas and what enhance what are the right data sets that are pertinent to them. So LIBA um, and Healthy Communities Institute have uh, are mixed, a mixed, remarkable organization, a mix of technologists, designers, researchers. And one of the person that's been working with the Healthy Communities Institute is uh, Nikolai Kurienko here on stage. Um, he actually developed a iPad app that was used as part of a recently completed 30-patient uh, study at UCSF. So imagine a, cr a patient coming to see their, their doc. Doc says, hey, how have you been doing? Pulling up his app and then seeing over the last two months, three months, exactly what's been going on, whether it's Withing Scales, inputs, Fitbit data, uh, on flare up on onsets, adherence to medications, et cetera, and shown in a way that's actually intelligible and compelling so that 
they can then in turn partner and better decide what's the best course of action going forward. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce virtually um, Ian Eslick. So Ian is a um, serial entrepreneur, uh, a PhD candidate at MIT. He's a Leba Fellow, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, and he's the chief architect of C3N. So he really understands how technology works and, how, and has thought a lot about how you make those interplay and play nice with each other. And he's been a, a key player in trying to have those new technologies adopted within the context of this improved care now. So um, Ian, can you tell us a little bit about some of the, diff um, some of the challenges you've faced in designing the toolkit, so sort to of, sort of speak, and having those adapt in, in, a, in a traditional clinical setting? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'm gonna repeat a little bit of what Dominic said earlier. The network that we're working in, the Improved Care Now Network, is a network primarily of doc uh, process specialists who focus on how do we share practice to improve outcomes for patients. Several years ago, Peter Margolis, uh, Jesse Dillon at Libba, and a few other partners at various institutions came together for something called the C3N, the Collaborative Chronic Care Network, uh, of which I became a member about a year ago. And you can think of the C3N as the research arm of the Improved Care Now Network. And its goal is to take this clinician network and really intimately involve researchers and patients in all aspects of the care cycle. That 50% increase, or that 50% decrease in uh, patients who were, had active disease came from primarily changing the way doctors behave during the clinical encounter. And most of chronic care happens outside of the doctor's office. It happens between visits. And so how do we bring patients into that loop? So the C3N is a multidisciplinary incubator or laboratory for exploring a number of different prototype interventions. These involve things such as self-care management, so tools for uh, looking at and observing your own behaviors and how those affect the way in which you're, you're managing your own care. Uh, tools for the family, support, uh, the patients. Um, one project that I joined uh, from a science standpoint, uh, given my PhD at MIT, is called an N of one uh, prototype. And what we do is when patients have problems or concerns for which there's limited or no clinical data, there's no good methodology right now to find out whether an intervention that a patient is trying or wants to try actually has an effect. So what we do is systematically design a small experiment just for that single patient to help understand whether that intervention is having a positive benefit. An example might be probiotics. So I got involved through the end of one prototype, but because the C3N is highly collaborative, uh, every time we meet somebody who can add something to the mix, we try to bring them into to the core team. Uh, and so for the last year, I've been really working with uh, a number of the different prototype groups, as well as the uh, management team of the C3N, thinking about, as Dominique said, how do we incorporate all these wonderful technologies that are out there into the process that we're engaged in? And the challenges are not as bad as you might think, but <laughs> there's a lot of coordination uh, challenges and technology cooperation challenges. One of the big ones that I hadn't really realized until I got into this process is that it's one thing to do a research project and explore whether or not a technology has some benefit in a particular context, but ultimately we'd like to take the technology to develop and make them available to all 10,000 children that are in this network and to the hundreds of thousands of patients, uh, adults and children, outside the network. So there's a big question of how do we take the research and at what point do we engage with the research project if it can or cannot continue on and become something we can actually deliver to patients. Secondly, there are severe challenges in accessing patient electronic data, even for research purposes, because of the nature of the hospital IT systems and the constraints that they're under to protect the privacy of that patient data. Or if you'll hear a little bit more about that from Patients Know Best. So the other thing we often forget as technologists or entrepreneurs is how important the human components of innovation are. The process that an organization like Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which is a very progressive children's hospital, 
all of the different stakeholders within the organization who are involved have to be trained, their data processes have to be influenced. And so you need to spend a lot of time thinking about the education, training materials, ongoing process. One of the surprising barriers when you're bringing in people from many different disciplines is we all use different language to describe the same things. And then we often talk about things that the others aren't aware of. So what I have found is one of the biggest barriers to making forward progress is getting everybody to, to talk the same language and sometimes to play nicely. So I think that the, what this experience has done very well is find people who are interested in solving the problem, recognize their own interests, and we work to make sure that we form projects that serve those interests but also ultimately serve the patients. Uh, which is the ultimate end goal of everything that we're doing here. So I'm going to pause there for a second and let Dominique ask any questions if he would like. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ian. I'm going to go and, and, and ask, reach out to Anmol and ask a, a, a specific question to um, his experience. So actually, uh, Ginger I already has a collaboration with uh, Cincinnati Children's and uh, C3N, and they're one of the first technologies that have been sort of rolled into the mix. Um, can you share with us your experience uh, trying to get your technology adopted in, in the clinical setting? Absolutely. So uh, I'm Anmol. I actually met the uh, <coughs> C3N folks when I was a graduate student at the Media Lab with Ian um, at the time as well. And so we've been, uh, we've been working with the group at C3N for uh, several months now, even longer. It's been an interesting experience for us because most of our team is sort of computer scientists and we're all, you know, we all come from the world of web and so on. And, and health has been an interesting story because understanding the different nuances of getting our system out there and deployed um, was rather fascinating. I think there are a few things that work really well. Um, what I like about the group, you know, not just here, the group at sort of C3N as well, is that this is one of the few communities that encourages validation of these sort of new digital health um, ideas or, or technologies that are coming out, right? So if you think of like, from Sean's perspective or my perspective is, there are all these engineers who are building these amazing gadgets and reducing heart rate monitors into these little cell phones and building amazing UI for their apps, but when they go hit the healthcare system and they go hit the providers and they go hit the payers, it's sort of a whole new battle that has to start from scratch, right? Uh, and so I think C3N is one of the very few communities across the country which has managed to give an ecosystem where that validation can happen in a very step-by-step -step process and people get pushed through that. Um, the things that we've learned, um, things on the, especially on the sort of researcher slash uh, provider slash nurse interface, the, the idea of enrolling patients, the ability to um, integrate in that person's workflow has been interesting. We, our platform has gone through a couple of uh, generations of iteration just based on feedback to some of the users we have at C3N. Um, and it's come to a point, and I'll give you another example, not from, uh, from C3M, one of the other groups using our system, which was informed by uh, the, the C3M uh, partnership, is um, so num some of the groups using our system are, are, are underprivileged, where they have um, one of our, our installed uh, customers has basically 25% of their patients make less than $18,000 a year. So these are people who you know, have smartphones, don't necessarily speak English, and so on. Um, and so they've shown how they can get these people to install our app on their phone in less than 20 seconds, right? But that's the sort of workflow, the understanding of what it takes to get that patient to install in the real world environment is, uh, is what that CTN experience is, uh, has been really powerful for us. Thank you. So, um, Nikolai, so much, Ian, you, could you share with us your experience in getting your, your technology? So, quick reminder, you, you, you built an iPad app as part of a um, research experiment at UCSF with 30 patients to see if the, having a data available on a real-time basis at the, at the point of care could help improve the experience for both the patient um, and, and, and the physician. Could you share what that experience was like once you had the iPad built and trying to get that incorporated into this, in the clinical setting and what, what was the sort of iterative, process, iterative process associated with that if there was one at all? Awesome. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say it's a privilege to share this stage with folks who are working to make what some people call an invisible chronic illness visible. And that's essentially the essence of what we were trying to do at UCSF with our pilot is the way patients navigate care is by voice um, in conversations in clinic and at the bedside. And in my own experience through 10,000 hours in the hospital and eight years without a diagnosis, it's challenging to share that story persuasively when people can't see your illness. And so what we tried to do, um, funded by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, is give patients the ability to record observations of daily living, things like pain via SMS, 
you know, weight, from a thinks weight scale, and Fitbit activity data. <laughs> Sorry for that. And um, empower them to share that story at the point of care in a way that um, provided a visual for something that's otherwise unseen. And so we had some interesting findings uh, over the last two and a half years around how that actually performed in clinical use. Okay, I'll, uh, we'll get back to you. Maybe you can, can chime in based on your experience as, as others share. Um, and now I'm gonna go to Mohammed. So Mohammed, um, you are the first person that I know of that was able to fully integrate their personal health record system with an NHS, uh, which now provide the, the ability for you to provide, uh, for patients to provide continuous or more uh, comprehensive view of their medical records with their care providers. Um, could you share with us some of that experience of having physicians adopt or be willing to in sign into a web portal to access and look at patients' uh, records? Sure, so um, we're very proud of the, the product and lots of physicians when they use it, they say it's great, it's been designed perfectly for their workflow, but when we started the company, um, we knew that the product was almost irrelevant because really um, the problems when, in adoption were not to do with technology, they were to do with change management and they were to do with trust. Um, and that's what uh, lots of other people had failed to appreciate when they were building their own personal health record platforms in the past. So um, I'll give you one example on the, um, the change management. So uh, we basically have our account management staff, our physicians and nurses, uh, because we have to go through every single um, well phrased, but completely incorrect objection that clinicians have to working in this way with patients. So um, I started in the USA. I'd learned about all this from a book I was writing about patient portals. And then I started Patients Know Best and brought uh, that kind of work to the UK. And so the first two or three years, um, all these U UK physicians would tell me, you know, that's great that the Americans can do this, but this is really for American uh, yeah, consumers and where the money is all that matters. It's really not something that would work in England. And we'd say, no, no, let's show you. You've got to show you exactly how this works in England. And after it worked in the UK and the National Health Service, we began getting customers from the USA. And the irony is that after we crossed back to the, uh, the other side of the Atlantic, the Americans, the first thing they would tell me is, oh, of course, this works in the UK and the National Health Service, where you guys um, have a government system, but this couldn't possibly work in a private healthcare system. So everybody thought there was a reason why they couldn't do it, but it was just that it's something new, and you have to kind of always do the chain management. Um, the, the other side is the, the trust. So um, everybody can agree that this would be a good outcome if you could share the data and move it around different institutions for the benefit of the patient, but nobody really trusts the party that they're moving the data around to. Um, they don't trust the big companies, they don't trust the small companies, they don't trust the government to do it correctly, no, nobody trusts each other. So we worked very early on, very hard on gaining people's trust. We created a social enterprise. Um, we um, trained people on the patient being controlled, that's the thing that matters. Uh, we encrypted the data so that nobody else gets it apart from the patient and that the patient chooses. Um, and then we also made sure that for as long as possible, although we're getting money from venture capitalists, we always took just uh, low enough amounts of money that they would never get on the board. Uh, so it was always about keeping company that was patient focused and demonstrably um, we could be trusted with the data. And so once you get the trust and once you get the change management, then the physicians can focus on the product and then you can focus on the benefits of patients, but you have to start from those two areas, um, and, and, and they were key for us. Okay. Well, thank you, Mohammed. Um, I'll, let me go, go back to you a little bit later. So, uh, Sean, uh, could you briefly, briefly describe for us your 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 web portal, your patient patient portal, um, so we get a better sense of what that experience is like for a patient that would log on. But also, could you tell us a little bit about your motivation to start talking with Mohammed on building APIs so that the data flows seamlessly across those two platforms to help you guys understand the value of creating these networks um, and having data flow um, that a lot of entrepreneurs and um, great researchers up here are doing, um, you have to think about like what it's like to live with a chronic condition. And maybe a few of you have one, um, but it's literally like walking around with a rock in your shoe, but in some cases, walking around with a boulder in your shoe. So if you think if you have MS, RA, psoriasis, IBD, lupus, PTSD, just th think of all these condi conditions. You wake up in the morning and you are physically ailing. Right? So your life starts to get defined by that sort of um, interaction with your body. And so 
I took my own experience with Crohn's disease, um, which is an autoimmune condition, um, which we're all sort of working with here, um, and it affects your digestive tract. And I thought, you know, what if someone could build some software just for me? What if I had a programmer who could just do all that? Um, and what would that software look like to help me understand my uh, condition and help me get information about it? Um, it was fortunate that I was a programmer, so I could actually do that. Um, and, and the first thing that I realized is that a lot of these other patients out there are experts. And, uh, you know, I met Kolya out here at UC Berkeley, and he was one of those patient experts. Uh, he taught me a lot about what it's like to live with Crohn's disease and a whole bunch of treatment options I had never known before. So what I built was Chronology, and essentially it was an app that helped me manage my, my Crohn's, manage my condition. Um, it's kind of like a Facebook or a Yelp or a Wikipedia. You can come up with any analogy you want, but it connects you to other patients to share and understand their knowledge. Um, so the first step is just that connection, right? Um, and so we actually um, organize meetups to actually get patients together in person and build bonds. The second step is then helping their patient understand their own condition so they can track their health and kind of record a health history. And then the third step is us taking that recorded health history and being able to crunch it and push it back at patients so that patients can understand uh, different treatments that people are trying so they can navigate uh, their own course. So the reason that we're working with Patients Know Best is really um, a case of, of comparative advantage of the skill sets that we have and the skill sets that Mohammed has. I know a lot about consumer-facing web applications. I know about living with the condition and building stuff outside the doctor's office but I know almost squat about interfacing with EHRs, pushing data back and forth uh, from these healthcare institutions. And that's where Mohammed and Patients Know Best shines, and that's kind of why there's a good relationship there. Thank you. So um, in the context of this demonstration project that I just described to you, obviously we're still designing it. We're meeting in a couple of weeks to actually look at what the research study looks like exactly and timelines, budget, all that good stuff. But um, what was your initial motivation to actually engage and work with such a diverse group of people. And please don't be don't use Kaufman stuff. Don't keep the Kaufman thing out of it, but more in terms of trying to be selfish in how you describe it and what you saw as, the, as an opportunity uh, for your business and what you're trying to achieve. So I'll leave it open and, and you can grab that as you, as you see fit. I'll start. Um, so I, I was alluding to this earlier, but I really think it's uh, it's about finding, for us as a technology company, finding that clinical partner for, for validation and for sort of going to scale. Um, and when we started talking to Peter and, and some of the other folks, it was still an idea. Um, now we've had patients on it for quite a while, and now we're talking about the next level where beyond just C3 and making this uh, something that we distribute jointly across, uh, across the bot populations. For us, it sort of fit in very seamlessly with the business model that we were building at the company. I guess I can chime in next. Uh, you know, our simple goal is to empower patients and providers to see the same story at the same time at the point of care. And that's really my motivation as a patient. Um, recently at the White House Summit on Patient Access to Data, I spoke to the need for a participatory health record and testified before the HIT Policy Committee on Patient Generated Data. And this is really what's driving me is I feel strongly that if democracy is defined by participation, then how can it be that our health records are not? So as both someone who has this condition um, and being at UC Berkeley, I feel like there's a unique moment in history where we have the opportunity to change the way that care is delivered and give patients a voice in their care. So I'll say that as first being a patient who's lost several friends to this disease at a young age and has suffered close calls myself, I see a lot of miscommunication at the point of care. So first of all, I'd like to address those issues. But as, a, as an entrepreneur, though, it's difficult because having this disease and being in and out of the hospital, you're constrained in a lot of ways that um, makes life challenging in terms of um, you know, typical business relationships. So one thing that I know is that patients who experience these, these problems firsthand have a lot of value to contribute. Um, but it's, I think, a world where we need new models to engage those patients in the process in an equitable way. So um, to be honest about my motivation, that's sort of where it starts, and I don't know exactly where that will lead me um, as a researcher that wants to keep going with this, but. Great, thanks for, thank you for sharing that. 
Tom, do you want yeah, to yeah um, I share a lot of the same motivations as the rest of the panel up here. Um, ultimately, it comes down to sort of personal motivation and personal vision um, of connecting patients to one another. And, and as Coley mentioned, it's really about taking the value of those patient experts and having their voice heard and um, used to its full capacity. And so I think just connecting patients to one another is sort of half capacity, but connecting patients back into the existing health institutions uh, takes it to 100%. Um, so once you do that, uh, you're, you're really fully utilizing the patient experience. And what's great as well is I think we, we can possibly get some clinical relevance out of um, working with you guys because we, if our software of helping patients find knowledge from other patients and being more engaged in their care can actually improve their outcomes, then we have something that's very compelling to health institutions out there. Mohammed? So from my side, uh, again, to echo all the sentiments, I'll just add the, the selfish reasons. So um, if you're trying to spread change, um, the number one thing is to work with the best clinicians uh, in a particular country. So uh, Improved Care now are just great partners. Um, they've assembled not only um, amazing clinicians, but also the ones who are really focused on improving care. And then the second reason is um, all the other partners that uh, we get to collaborate with, um, they all work on um, integration and sharing data amongst different vendors. And so one of the things we want to demonstrate is actually what happens when you have software vendors who are focused on exchanging data for the benefit of the patient uh, rather than holding on to the data for the benefit of the vendor. We want to demonstrate in this project that if you have the top clinicians and you have the vendors collaborating together, you will get far superior outcomes uh, and far superior cost bases for all of healthcare. Yeah, I'll just follow on to that and say that one of the biggest challenges in healthcare is that it, one of the easiest business models is making information a scarce resource that you can monetize. And the hospitals struggle with this too because their competitive advantage is with each other, especially at the larger hospitals, are their ability to provide better outcomes for the patients. And so their health is a complex system. And that means that any single intervention it's very hard to have dramatic impact. So as an entrepreneur, I put my entrepreneur hat on, and I'm thinking about companies in this space, working with this group is really important because you cannot do a single company that's going to do, engage in all of the interventions that need to happen at the same time to change the system in a way that's meaningful. And so if you want to build an enterprise that has a large impact, both economically for the enterprise, but also on the system that you're working in, you know, you have to have partners who are able to collaborate, who are able to adjudicate all of the complex uh, alignments and uh, competition, because ultimately, if we're able to dramatically shift the way in which care is delivered and our model of how we generate these better outcomes, then there's, there's an unbelievable economic opportunity, because we're currently spending about a trillion dollars a year on this complex. So I think that the difficulty that you have to recognize is that it's a much harder market um, to have a dramatic impact on because of all of the existing entrenched uh, interconnected interests. And so working with a group like this allows you to really work with that entire system and find the partners who together are going to allow you to have that impact. Thank you. So I think what I'd like to do is uh, offer the audience the, the opportunity to ask questions. Um, obviously the design, we're still building it, so there's not much for us to be able to answer to you right now because it'll change likely tomorrow. But in terms of the actual um, experience around trying to intervene in the clinical setting, this may be an opportunity for you to ask questions to, to our uh, panelists. So, raise your hands if you want to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you for talking. I really appreciate it. Um, so, I have this idea that when no, no, it's not an idea. I have just this, uh, this, this notion that if, if everyone's using a similar device, let's say I'm building a hardware, I'm building a pain treatment device, that I feel has potential to be really disruptive. And and if I have, well, let's say, a, a bunch of different people using a single device and, and it has software capability, what sort of philosophical approaches to connecting these devices to improve that sort of interaction? Do you guys have, have any really advice or any, any thoughts in terms of, of um, inspiration to, to, to uh, Leverage all the, the different 
uh, interactions with the device and then the different patients that could be possibly um, utilized. I'm sorry, I'm kind of screwing this question up because it's not really clear in my head. But if you have any, if you understood even what I said, if you could comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> so just to summarize that question, um, I think the question is, if you're building new sensor hardware, what are the philosophies that you need to think about? Um, I have a couple of personal favorites. I know people here would have more. Um, so one thing for me is, uh, is we're in a time where there's, there's an explosion of data, there's an explosion of sensors. It's all about making insights from that data, whether it's passive or active or community-based or self-report. Um, it's important to take direct value to patients um, as sort of granted. That's like fundamental to the systems that you're building. Um, and how that value is represented is up for discussion. Maybe it's some data that's fed back to the patient themselves. Maybe it goes to the caregiver, I think all of those. But designing experiences around those platforms and products, you, you can't ignore patient value. You can't just take that data and send it to uh, a third party and that's just a private, you know, that's just a nightmare. Um, and I think that extends on, if you take that, take that a step forward, is to how you think about privacy, right? Um, and I think one of the, the fundamental principles, again, is, is we have to start thinking of these, um, I'm not talking about the EMR systems, but the new kinds of data that are being collected, uh, which are traditionally not even considered health data. Um, you have to start sort of give people complete control over what data is, is being collected, how is it being collected, and how is it being used, um, and the ability to opt out of that. and, and use. I think those are, though I've seen a, a couple of places where people have gone wrong on something as fundamental as that. Um, and I think at this day and age, uh, you have to take those, those things into account. Yeah, uh, thanks for, uh, for talking uh, on this topic. I, I can't tell you how heartening and encouraging it is to see you guys focusing on this. It was just six years ago that Andy Grove won the Fogarty Innovation Award at Stanford. And after he spoke about how to change the healthcare systems, four Nobel laureates stood up and said that the only way it could be changed was through national catastrophe or economic collapse. So maybe one could argue we're in economic collapse, I, I don't know, but, but there are, you, you can throw out the baby with the bathwater. And having said that, one of the things I would worry about being in the system is the reason we have clinical trials and, and randomized trials is to avoid the placebo effect, avoid, avoid treatment based on anecdote, et cetera. So as patients communicate more often with patients, how do you account for those factors and how do you keep something that a patient thought worked for them from being publicized uh, without it actually having scientific credibility? Ian, I think that's a question for you. Yeah, so that's uh, dead center in the, in the research that I'm, I'm working on and, and I'm interested in. I'd say number one, you can't stop it. It's happening. Millions and millions of people are, are spending billions of dollars on interventions about which we know very little. Uh, fortunately, most of them, not all of them, are relatively harmless, so it's mostly about an opportunity cost. But the ones that are harmful, the reality is that actually patients pass information among themselves better than doctors do. So when I've looked at cancer communities, cancer communities will often get out ahead of where an average clinician is in terms of understanding what treatments are relevant, what treatments are available, what trials are currently active. So uh, for example, uh, Ronnie Zeiger uh, has left Google and started a company to help amplify the patient's voice, but also to filter out um, what's being shared. And I, I think, it, and to do so in a way that benefits both the patients, but also the pharma company, their understanding of, say, post-trial surveillance, which isn't done very well. So I think there's an opportunity, and this, the central philosophy of C3N is that patients are actually quite valuable, and you need to treat them with respect. They have to recognize, just like doctors have limitations, so do patients, but I think that lack of respect, that traditional paternalistic view patients is breaking down slowly, particularly as a new generation of practitioners emerges. But, uh, so that would be my first answer. The second one is that it's actually possible to build evidence about whether or not something works without having to do a full clinical trial. So my own research looks at how do we bridge anecdotes to clinical trial? Well, clinical trials are expensive. People's careers rest on them. So you only do them when you're pretty certain that you're likely to have an outcome or you're gonna make a lot of money afterwards. And so the, the trick is to say, as a patient, if you're using something that you think works, how do you build evidence so that eventually you can motivate somebody to do a more rigorous study? And uh, you know, that would be a longer discussion offline, but the work that we're doing at Cincinnati Children's Hospital with the N of one trials, and we take a patient who's using probiotics. There's actually not a lot known about the role of probiotics. So we monitored the probiotic use in a randomized schedule where we used that patient's own baseline conditions uh, 
as the control. And it's, it's complicated to do these, but by taking advantage of the kinds of tools that the various panelists are talking about today, we can actually get a lot more insight into what's going on with that patient outside of the clinic. And we've had several really interesting discoveries that have benefited the individual patients just in our first population of 10. And my own work looks at how do we scale that model uh, much more rapidly. Can I jump in on that question yes, real quick? Yes, please. So, I'm actually one of two patients at UCSF that's currently receiving an experimental therapy for Crohn's called IVIG. And because I have a Y things weight scale, I don't know if you guys can see this out there, but my all time low as uh, weight as an adult, as an inpatient was 151 pounds here back in mid December. And since I started this therapy, it's kind of off the charts. I weigh like 173 now. And um, in terms of our provider who's a PI on our grant actually responding to that data in clinical use, he's actually um, seen the dramatic impact that this drug has had and is now um, actively trying to prescribe it for other patients. So um, I think it's really remarkable to see how evidence that's been generated from um, our project in particular has captured a response to a, a promising new therapy. Um, and so maybe it's an anecdote in any other prior context, but now we actually have data. So I think that's really exciting. Thanks for sharing that. One question back. So I had a question. It seems as though some of the data you'd be collecting, for example, uh, that you were discussing would be somewhat non-traditional information that wouldn't usually be available to clinicians. Now I'm wondering whether you've seen a change in the way in which the clinicians are evaluating your condition and whether you actually think that there may be new insights or that the actual science or understanding of the pathophysiology will be influenced by the availability of this new data. If I could just follow up on that real quick. This drug that I'm on is not cheap. It's $55,000 a month. And based on this data, they could see that there was a clear half-life effect. I would get extremely sick in the week prior to my next infusion, and my weight would start dropping off because I would stop eating because I was in pain again. And based on that data, they're prescribing it every three weeks now at a significantly higher cost based on, you know, the why things weight scale. So. Um, you know, in the right context, this data does affect how care is delivered in a profound way. Yeah, the, the proof is in the pudding. Um, when we work with clinicians and we're collecting longitudinal data, which might be via SMS or an iPad app or the Ginger IO data, we present that longitudinal record to a doctor who has actually designed the measures with the patient. The uh, excitement and uptake, and in fact, the uh, the way it changes the doctor-patient encounter is pretty profound. So within Cincinnati Children's Hospital, there's huge demand uh, from all the different departments for us to get this out and make it more widely available. So I would say that a lot of it is it's going to be hard until we have a lot of clinical data on how, say, a group that has gone through the end of one trial experience has better outcomes than a group that hasn't. We also need to reduce the cost and burden on both the patient and doctor. And that's part of where you know, innovative entrepreneurs come in. But I, I think that this transition is happening, but it's happening quietly and in small corners of, of the healthcare system. There are not very many doctors and patients and, and care systems with the, I, I think, sophistication of the C3N. But there are a few, and I think the awareness of the value of them is growing. Um, if I can add to that answer. Uh, go ahead. Quickly, yeah. So, um, so Ginger IO is based on the premise of collecting behavior data outside the clinic. So it's things like movement and communication and accelerometers and other sensors that people may have and self-reports in addition to all of that. And I think what's happening for all of us as a, as a community of researchers and, and engineers is we're getting better at understanding what you know, the, the clinical behavior metrics that the people are used to studying, but how they manifest themselves in all these sorts of sensor data. Um, and the more data we have, we're sort of at the cusp of this revolution, but the more data we have, the better we'll get at it. We'll have really good behavior signatures, I imagine, five years from now, 10 years from now. Jay? Hi, Jay. I Jay. guess the last, the last thought is that the um, clinical trial models, to some degree, assumed a poverty of patients, that there just aren't enough, or it's too expensive to get too many. Uh, if you look at a company like Zio, who's been around for a little while now, they have the largest collection of sleep data in the, in the world, and by a factor of 10. Uh, or more. And so I, I think that there are things that you can do with, uh, like for example, the partner's uh, medical records have been used to show things that, uh, where they could detect in the medical records, say the biops, uh, heart attack risk, uh, well ahead of that observation from clinical practice. So I think that the role of, of quote, I hate the term, but big data 
is significant, um, and I think people are actually perhaps even more aggressively looking at different opportunities as we collect large amounts of data, even if it's noisier, the sheer amount of it actually allows us to learn much more effectively, uh, or at least to reduce our risk of doing clinical research because we're seeing very clear patterns uh, in, in this broad set of data. Sure. Hi, hello. Jay Joshi. I guess um, each of you kind of touched on this in your own little way, but I wanted you guys to elaborate a little bit more. In terms of clinical validation, can you talk a little bit about some of the specifics you guys have seen in terms of clinical metrics, in terms of economic metrics, productivity-wise, just how about you taking the data and then making meaningful, whether it's outcomes or trends based off of that, and more census about the clinical validations? So my fellow panelists can probably speak better um, specifically to your questions on this, but I can speak to the design of the trial. Um, sort of one of the hypotheses we have in mind is that connecting patients like this is going to reduce costs on the medical system and possibly improve outcomes. Um, and those are two things that we'll measure over a sort of a one year to two year timeline. But both of these panelists are closer to the clinical side, so I'll let them speak to that. Yeah, um, so we have a collection of, you know, uh, so my background and a couple of my colleagues at Jinjayo, um, we are sort of computer science researchers used to working with this data. We have publications. You can see them on our website if you visit Jinjayo. Uh, mostly in sort of the computer science area, machine learning based on human behavior data um, for the sort of health outcomes. Um, some of those, and so, so we have that body of literature. I think there's a second uh, order which, which you rightly pointed out, which is the economic impact. Uh, and I think we're at the point where we have, uh, not necessary for IBD, but for some of the other conditions, um, shown that there's a link between how people behave and which days they're likely symptomatic once you know that they're diagnosed. But then the second step, which is, okay, if you do intervene, and whether the intervention is an SMS or it's a, it's a nurse calling them or something else that happens, as soon as you detect this change in behavior or change in quality of life, um, then what is that economic impact? And that's the kind of data we hope to collect uh, with some of these collaborations. I guess I'll just quickly say that I think you can get really bogged down, as we did early on, trying to find the most appropriate clinically validated measures to have patients capture. But what we found, and I think it's sort of a philosophy of project health design, is what's most important is that patients actually bring that data into the clinical discussion. So for example, um, it's pretty easy, you know, the pain scale 1 to 10. Um, patients being able to show that data at the same time um, that they're having the discussion with the doctor. Um, as well as things like the weight, which has been interesting in the context of if that makes it a, a, an FDA, um, you know, sort of covered product, given that we're making clinical decisions. Um, but, but essentially, getting that data in front of doctors um, during clinical appointments is really the most important thing, um, not necessarily that they're validated, because at the end of the day, you want to facilitate that conversation and make sure that the patient's voice is being heard. All right, last question, Uri. Uh, since you're discussing uh, clinical interventions in, in some cases, how do you envision uh, at scaling the informed consent process uh, to multiple sites, multiple states, countries, um, if you, since you have a different nature of the informed consent, sometimes you go hospital by hospital, doctor by doctor, country by country, you have to have requirements that you're going to need to change. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that, and I'm not the expert, but my colleagues here will, will intervene or correct me. But so there's two things. So within context of this this study, it's uh, obviously it's a federated RRV process through the Proof Care Now Network, so that's taken care of. But if you sort of think about how would you extrapolate assuming a patient consents to have their data uh, shared in a specific uh, way, how do you sort of enable that? And so one of my colleagues, John Wilbanks, um, who's a fellow at Kaufman, but also a fellow at, at Liva, uh, ironically, he um, has been spending a lot of time working on that. And so if you go to weconsent.us, you'll see a lot of information, what we call the portable informed consent that enables those kinds of interventions to be scaled. Yeah, that was one of the challenges that I mentioned, but uh, when you're bringing a new technology in to a network like Improved Care Now, every institution's IRB uh, often will want to weigh in, particularly when you're in the research phase, and you're not approving it for the whole network, but you're really, uh, you know, the doctor from this institution, so they need their approval. And learning how to frame the problem, understand the issues that are going to come up, is, is a very critical part of getting these interventions into the, the clinical process. 
Okay, so I think I'd like to um, thank our panelists. If you just stick around for a little bit more, just five more minutes, I'll have a couple comments and I'll have a final montage to share with you. So uh, thank you again, panelists.